rejection slip. And I said, well, where are you going to send it now? And she said, I'm going to send it to the Ladies' Home Journal. Well, this is the post. They're the, both the Curtis Publishing Company. And I tried to tell her that, and she said, well, I don't care if they do belong to the same company. There's some women editors on the Ladies' Home Journal. And if I can get this manuscript in the hand of a lady editor, we'll get it published. I don't think she thought too much of the men editors. She sent it to the journal, and I never went through anything like that in my life. About six weeks went by, and we didn't hear anything. And I began to get a little nervous. And then after about two months, and we hadn't heard anything, why, I wasn't nervous. I was getting sick. And I told my wife, I said, I think I know what happened. That thing got lost in the mail. She said, oh, I don't think so. I had it heavily insured. And I, we went to the library and got some books, and it said, don't query your editor. Give them plenty of time. Two months. But I hung in there, and you know it went on for about four months. And one day I got a letter. I still have the letter from a lady editor on the lady staff of the Ladies Home Journal, Annie Inslin. And I don't know, I never have figured this out. The letter said, Dear Mr. Rawls, I'm sorry that it has taken us so long to evaluate your manuscript. And now we have very reluctantly come to the conclusion that it is the wrong kind of a story for a ladies' magazine. It took them people four months to figure that out. <laughs> But she didn't stop there. She said, but I want to see this story published, Mr. Rawls, and I want you to give me permission to take it to the Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> I wrote and told her I didn't care where she took it. She thought she could get it published, but it had already been rejected by the Post. But she carried it over there anyhow. But it didn't go to the first readers that time. It went to the big man. Ben Hibbs. He took it home with him and he called me in the wee hours of the morning. He said, Mr. Rawls, I just finished this boy and dog story. I want to serialize it in the Saturday Evening Post. I couldn't believe what he had told me. It took quite a while for it to soak in. But once it registered that I had made the serialization in one of the biggest magazines in the world at that time. Over 16 million subscriptions besides what they sold on the stand. And once that it did register on me just what I had accomplished, I first I was scared and then I got real proud. Boy, did I ever get proud. I wouldn't have spoke to Ernest Hemingway if I'd have met him in the middle of the road. <laughs> and you know, we still have the old post. During that year, they had the Jackie Cooper story serialized in it. The Dean Atchison story was serialized. And another big politician, I don't know who he was, he had a three-part serial in it. At the end of the year, I had a letter. I still have the letter. My little boy and dog story pulled more letters into the editors of the Saturday Evening Post than all three of those big names put together. I was very proud of that, too. I wouldn't have spoke to a politician either if I didn't. <laughs> then she went farther. She took it over to one of the biggest publishing companies in the world, Doubleday and Company. Right off, they accepted it. And then they broke my heart. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here today. See, it was first titled, The Hounds of Youth. Right away, these brilliant editors at Doubleday, they changed the title to Where the Red Fern Grows. And you know, for about six years, my little book sat out there on the shelves, and it didn't sell anything. No one knew anything about it. And they didn't put too much publicity behind it. 
Even Mr. Sargent, one of the head men of Doubleday, admitted that in his own writing in the Publishers Weekly. And they were going to call it out of print. We think come so close to losing this story forever. They have meetings about once or twice a year, these big publishers, and say they've got six, seven, eight hundred books they've published that year. There'd be a lot of those books that's not paying their way, and if they don't pay their way, they don't stay in print. Red Fern wasn't paying its way. They were going to call it out of print. But there was one little agent, Bob Brinehold, out of Salt Lake City. He just kept fighting. He had read the story, and he loved it. And he fought those editors up one side and down the other. He said, if you just give this story a chance, put some publicity behind it, he said, it would, be, it would go. And the last time they were going to call it out of print, they gave him three months. He said, well, give me just another three months with it. And he got me a speaking engagement at the University of Salt Lake at Professor Landau at the Intermountain Conference of Children's Literature. I had over 5,000 reading teachers there from all over the world. I'd never given a talk in my life, but boy, did I talk to those teachers. You might say Wilson Rawls' speech that day at the University of Utah was a revival speech, meant to bring back to life once again his boy and dog story. The long and the short of it was this. Those teachers and librarians, coupled with the copies of his book that had been made available for the conference, with a great burst of publicity the book needed from the beginning. Strange as it seems, the publisher had actually been trying to sell it all along as a book for the adult reader, not as a children's book. But when the teachers and librarians went back to their schools and began reading it aloud and sharing it with students, the letters began to pour into the publisher, and so did the book orders. At that point, the publisher began to reconsider how it was selling the book. They began marketing it for children and their teachers. Each year since then, it has sold more copies than the previous year. Indeed, it has become an American children's classic. When people heard the story of Wilson Rawls' life, they often thought of all the years he had spent struggling to write, years of being unknown and unpublished. They imagined what other great books he might have written in those years of obscurity, and then they would ask him if he had any regrets. Here is how he would answer them. I've always told them, well, sure, I, no, I don't have any regrets. I set a goal in my life as a small boy. It took a long time to get there, but I finally got what I wanted out of life. I'm a writer now. But if I do have any regrets, it would be just one. I wish my dad could have lived to where one more time I could have walked up to him, just like I did the day I walked up to him with that story in my hand, a barefooted boy, and said, Dad, do you think I could ever write a story like that? I wish he'd have lived to where one more time I could have walked up to him with these two books and just held them out to him and said, there they are, Dad. It sure took a long time. Wilson Rawls never had any children of his own, unless you count his readers. Then you could say he had millions of children. And during those last 20 years, the children's letters and his visits to their schools went a long way toward making up for the years of being unpublished and unknown. And I can't think of a better way to end this visit with Wilson Rawls than the little anecdote he'd like to tell about one school and one child. It speaks volumes about the man he was and the kind of soul it takes to write for children. Here he's talking about the letters from schools and his wondering whether the years of poverty and struggle were worth it. In my home, we have a room full of letters from these kids. And I thought it was all worth it, but you know, really, way down deep inside, I didn't know for sure whether it had been worth it or not. Uh, I know I worried my mother a lot all those years, and my brothers and sisters. But 
it was something I wanted to do and I just wouldn't quit it. But not long ago, I think that, uh, I think that that old boy up there has a way of finding these answers for you sometime because not long, just a few months before we left Idaho, there was a little school up in the edge of the Teton Mountains. And for about three years, about two or three times a year, I'd get a package of letters from every kid in that school. It was just a little country school. And they had seen me on TV and they'd uh, read about me in a paper and on the news and, and the movie. And every one of those kids in those letters, they'd say, Please, Mr. Earl, come talk to us. We know you talk to other schools all over the country. But it's kind of hard for us to go way off like that to one school. It's very expensive. And, and if Walt and I goes, we'd like to have a few schools to where we could meet quite a few kids. But uh, I didn't pay too much attention to the letters because it just looked like uh, there was no way I could get up there. But I'd been off on a trip, and boy, it was a grinding trip for about three weeks. It was in the winter, cold. I flew into the airport, and my wife picked me up. It was, oh, about 9 o'clock at night, spitting snow. And as we drove back to our home, we had to drive right through town. And we stopped at a stoplight, and we sat sitting there, and I was so tired and worn out, I wasn't saying anything. And my wife said, uh, you got another package of letters from that little school? And I said, I did. And she said, yeah. And I didn't pay any attention to it. We got home, and I took a good hot bath. And I was so tired and worn out, I couldn't go to sleep. She went off to bed. And I, she had my mail in a great big old box. And I was sitting, going through this mail. And I came to this package of letters from that little school. When I first picked it up and saw the, where it came from, I started to lay it over to one side, but I don't know why. I, something just said no. I opened it up and started reading the letters. Same thing all over again. Please, Mr. Rawls, come and talk to us. I went in, woke my wife up, and I said, Honey, we're going up to that little school. I can't take any more of these letters. <laughs> she said, well, good. When do you want to go? I said, well, I'll rest up tomorrow, and you can call up there and tell them we're coming. The day after that, why, we got in our car and drove up there. When we drove up in front of that little school, I wish you could have seen it. The kids were all looking out the window in the little school, and all of them were waving. And I was a waving with both hands. My wife was a driving. And just as I got out of the car, the doors to that little schoolhouse flew open, and here they come. The teacher couldn't do anything with them. And they come out, and they pawed on me all the way into the school. I talked to them for two hours. They had five books in their little school, and if you ever saw five ragged books, Boy, those had been used. I was sitting at a table like this, autographing the books for them. I had my arm up. The kids were all around me. And uh, all at once, off to my right, there was a commotion in the group, and I heard the older kids growling at somebody. And what it was, it was a little boy. He was so little, he couldn't see over them big kids. He wanted to see me. And he had ducked his head and was wiggling his way. And this is what they got all upset about. He wound up right by my side. And when he came up, the kids was all shoving him. I guess some of them was kicking at him, but he didn't care. And when he came up to my side, he kind of hit me, and I was autographing. And I turned around and looked at him. And uh, I could tell by looking at his clothes that he probably came from a poor family. He needed a haircut, I know that. And I noticed that his hands were kind of dirty. They had a dirt playground. 
but he had the sweetest smile I ever seen. And he leaned over and just in a kind of a whisper, he said, Mr. Rawls, I've read your Redfern story 13 times. He said, after hearing you today, I'm going to read it again. I know he was telling me the truth. I thanked him and I went on with my autograph and I thought that's all of it. But it wasn't. He just stood there and he had both hands up on the table and his left hand was about that far from my elbow where I was autographing. And I wasn't paying any attention to him. He was just standing there looking off like he didn't have a thought in the world. But I noticed that his left hand, he kept moving it over. And I thought, well, what's this kid going to do now? You never know what they're going to do. But I felt him when he touched me on the elbow. When he did, I turned around and looked at him, and he smiled again, and he ducked his head, and back through the crowd he went. And I sat there for several seconds trying to figure this out. And finally, I figured it out. All he wanted to do was just touch the man that wrote that story. That's all he wanted. He couldn't have wanted anything else. We went out and got in our car. I told my wife, I said, Honey, I think I found the answer to it all. She said, What do you mean? I said, I know now that those 40-something years of my life that I threw away, I know they were worth it. She said, how, how come you didn't know that now? And I said, oh, I know. I found it all, the answer to it all. She said, well, where'd you find the answer at? And I said, in the touch of a little boy's hand. <laughs> Thank you. Since it was first published in 1961, Where the Red Fern Grows has continued to win new fans each year among both school children and adults. With more than a million copies in print, it is among the five most widely read middle grade novels ever published in America and is frequently read aloud to children as young as six. The hardcover edition of Red Fern, as well as Wilson Rawls' other book, The Summer of the Monkeys, is published by Doubleday and the paperback by Bantam and both are available through your local bookstore and your local free public library.